Erica here with Prep Scholar GRE. Here today with an introduction to all of the different question types you can encounter on the GRE and how to approach each one. If you like this video, subscribe for more great content and check us out at gre.prepscholar.com to learn more about what Prep Scholar GRE can do for you. All right, we'll go ahead and start with the verbal section. The first category of question in the verbal section is text completion. Text completion questions require the test taker to complete sentences or sets of sentences by filling in words and phrases that make sense when plugged into the text. Now, there are three flavors of text completion question. The first is the one blank text completion question. These questions have one blank in the text and five answer choices. Each answer choice a word or phrase that could fit into the sentence. Now, of these answer choices, only one will complete the sentence in a logical way. So the best way to avoid wasting time on the four incorrect answer choices is to start by predicting an answer in your own words. Based on the sentence, what word or phrase would you put in the blank? Then we can find the answer choice that most closely matches our prediction. Now this prevents us from wasting time on wrong answer choices or convincing ourselves of answers that we would never have come up with on our own. We aren't going to spend a ton of time on how to predict, so for more on how to break down sentence structure to answer vocab-based questions, check out our How to Master GRE vocab video. The second flavor of text completion question is the two blank text completion question. Now, these questions have, obviously, two blanks in the text, each with three answer choices instead of five. So more blanks, but fewer choices for each. Now, in some cases, there is only one answer choice that makes sense in blank one and one answer choice that makes sense in blank two. These questions are fairly straightforward and a lot like working two one blank text completion questions. However, in other cases, it may be that multiple answer choices work for each individual blank, but only one pair of answer choices, so one for each blank, will make sense together. In other words, what we put in blank two depends on what we put in blank one. Now, because this is a possibility, it's important to consider the two blanks of the question together. This isn't two questions presented together, it's one question with two interdependent parts. Now, just like we do on our one blank questions, we want to predict an answer for each blank. However, we may need to be a little bit looser with our predictions. For instance, we may predict that blanks one and two will be opposites, but we can't say any more than that. We may predict that blanks one and two will both have a negative connotation, but we may not be able to nail down in exactly what they're gonna convey. Now, that's okay. The biggest thing to keep in mind on these questions is that in addition to considering how these blanks relate to the text around them, we consider how the blanks relate to each other. All right, the third and final flavor of text completion is the three blank text completion question. These questions have three blanks in the text, each with three answer choices. Basically, the two blank text completion question plus a bonus round. Now, as these are so similar to two blank questions, we're going to approach them in pretty much the same way. Be flexible with your predictions, but consider the blanks together as much as possible. Sometimes with these three blank questions, one blank stands alone while the other two blanks rely on each other. Sometimes all three blanks will rely on each other, but very rarely can we approach each blank individually and still get the question right. Text completion questions as a whole, so all of our different types, make up about six of the 20 questions on each verbal section, giving 12 total scored questions on each test. Text completion questions are usually divided pretty evenly among one, two, and three blank questions. If there's any variation, it'll favor two blank questions over one or three blank questions. All right, important to note for text completion questions, there is no partial credit for two and three blank questions. If we get one blank right and one blank wrong, we're gonna get the exact same result as if we get both blanks wrong. Similarly, two and three blank questions aren't worth any more points than one blank questions are. This means that often the more blanks a question has, the less likely it is that the time you invest on the problem will get you points. The problems both take longer and are harder to get completely right. So if you're struggling for time or struggling to predict for a two or three blank question, it's often a good idea to flag the question for later and invest your time on a question that's more likely to earn you points. All right, another category of question on the verbal section is sentence equivalence. Sentence equivalence questions are a lot like text completion. They require the test taker to complete sentences by filling in words or phrases that make sense when plugged into the sentence. However, there is an important distinction. 
for each question, there will be only one blank for which the, there will be six possible answer choices. Now of these six answer choices, the test taker must choose two that create equivalent sentences when plugged into the blank. Okay, so what does this mean for your sentence equivalent strategy? Now, just like text completion, we want to predict an answer. However, like our two and three blank questions, we need to consider our answer choices together. We may find that our first choice answer doesn't work because there isn't another answer choice that creates a similar meaning when plugged into the sentence. Now, sentence equivalence questions make up about four of the 20 questions on each verbal section, which gives eight total scored questions on each test. Just like two and three blank text completion questions, we can't get partial credit for getting one answer choice correct and the questions are worth just as many points as any other question on the verbal section. So again, prioritize your time accordingly. All right, the final category of question on the verbal section is gonna be reading comprehension. Now, reading comprehension questions ask us to answer a question or series of questions based on our reading of a passage. Now, like text completion, reading comprehension questions come in a few varieties. Now, the first type of reading comprehension question is multiple choice, select one. In these questions, the test taker is gonna be given five answer choice. Now, of these five answer choices, only one is going to be correct. Now, much like one blank text completion questions, our best bet here is to predict. We don't wanna waste any more time than necessary with wrong answer choices. Now, the second type of reading comprehension question is multiple choice, select one or more. Now, in these questions, the test taker is only given three answer choices, but of these three answer choices, one, two, or all three may be correct. All right, so here, some level of predicting is a good idea, but process of elimination becomes much more important. On select one questions, once we have a correct answer, we don't need to look at the other options too closely because they must be wrong. However, for select one or more questions, since each answer choice may be true, regardless of whether the others are true, we need to consider each one individually. Now, again, these questions do not have partial credit, nor are they worth any additional points for their additional effort. The third type of reading comprehension question is select in passage. Now, these questions require the test taker to select one sentence from the passage that correctly answers the question. So the first time test takers see this question type, they're often confused. Where are the answer choices? For these questions, we're gonna pick our answer by clicking on the sentence we want in the passage itself. So while the presentation is weird for these questions, we can treat them pretty much like any other multiple choice select one question. Predict, find the answer choice that best matches our prediction. But in this case, the answer choice will be a sentence in the passage. That's the only real difference. Now, there are a couple variations on this question type. Sometimes where our sentence is located is not specified. We can pick a sentence from anywhere in the passage, but in other cases where the sentence is located will be specified. So for instance, in the first two paragraphs. This is particularly common for questions based on long passages. Now, in this case, we will not be able to select a sentence outside of the specified area. This means that we'll never miss this question blindly but it does mean that we can waste time considering unimportant parts of the passage. Be sure to carefully read the question before predicting. All right, reading comprehension questions as a whole make up around 10 of the 20 questions per verbal section, or 20 scored questions in total on the test, meaning half of the verbal score. To learn more about this type of question, what skills these questions test, how to approach passages, larger reading comprehension strategy, etc feel free to check out our how to be reading comprehension questions video. All right, on to the quantitative section. The first type of quantitative question is quantitative comparison. Quantitative comparison questions ask us to compare two quantities and describe the relationship between them. Every quantitative comparison question has the same four answer choices. So first, quantity A is greater. Second, quantity B is greater. Third, the two quantities are equal. And fourth, the relationship cannot be determined from the information given. Now, only one of these four answer choices will accurately define the relationship between our quantities. So while the basic structure of these is a multiple choice select one question with only four answer choices, our strategy for quantitative comparison is fairly different from that of other multiple choice questions. We spend a lot of time in our how to beat quantitative comparison video talking about how to attack this particular question type. So for more strategy specific to this question type, check out that video. 
All right, quantitative comparison questions typically make up seven to eight questions on any given quantitative section for about 15 questions in total on the test. So it's worthwhile to nail down an effective strategy. However, despite their odd format, they aren't worth any more points than any other question on the section. So don't over prioritize them on test day. The second type of quantitative question is multiple choice select one. Now these work just like the reading comprehension ones. The test taker is given five answer choices of which only one is correct. However, our strategy here is a little bit different. Whereas predicting before looking at the answer choices has a lot of value on reading comprehension, the answer choices can actually help us solve on the quantitative section. As we interpret the question, organize our information, set up equations, etc., it's a good call to look at the answer choices we're choosing from to guide the direction we take our math. So for instance, if we didn't notice that all of the answer choices are expressions, we're likely to waste a lot of time solving for a specific value. Similarly, if we have a percents or ratio problem where we clearly have more of X than Y, we can often eliminate two or three of our answer choices for being too small, after which it may be quicker to test our remaining options than to solve algebraically. All right, the third type of quantitative question is multiple choice select one or more. These are slightly different from the ones we've seen in the reading comprehension section in that the number of answer options we're given can actually vary pretty widely. So we've seen between three and 10 answer options in multiple choice select one or more questions from official ETS materials. Now, a couple other variations on this question type that we only see in the quant section. For many questions, between one and all of the answer options may be true. However, for others, the question will specify how many answer choices you should select. So instead of saying indicate all such amounts or indicate all such statements, we may instead get indicate four such amounts or indicate two such numbers. It's important to read this part of the question carefully as we are able to pick as many answer choices as we want for these questions and we will miss the question unless we have the specified number of answers selected. All right, like the multiple choice select one or more questions we saw in the verbal section, process of elimination on each individual answer choice is critical here, and even more so as the number of answer options we should select increases. Again, these correct questions do not have partial credit, nor are they worth additional points for the additional correct answers. This means that these questions are often good candidates for skipping and coming back to later. All right, the fourth type of quantitative question is numeric entry. For these questions, the test taker isn't given any answer choices, just a field in which to enter their answer. So there are two variations here. In most numeric entry questions, test takers will be given one box in which they can enter an integer or a decimal. In other cases, test takers will be given two boxes in which they can enter a fraction. So the number on top will represent the numerator, while the number on the bottom will represent the denominator. Now, obviously for these questions, process of elimination goes out the window. We must solve directly for our answer. Now, in some cases, this can lead to a lower likelihood of solving as we don't have the option of working backwards from our answer choices. So keep this in mind when prioritizing your time. Okay, a couple important notes for these questions. First, equivalent forms of an answer will all be correct. For instance, 3.4 and 3.40 will both be viewed as the same. Similarly, two-fifths and four-tenths will be treated identically by the algorithm. So don't worry too much about reducing fractions. Second, unless specified, don't round your answer. However, if the question does specify that you are to round, you will miss the question if you do not round correctly. Similarly, because there is no way to check your answer, you must read the question very carefully. Make sure that you're answering the question that's actually being asked. All right, finally, remember that you can use the on-screen calculator to transfer your answer into the box using the transfer display button. This can save you some time and prevent an errors in retyping your answer. Okay, so finally, we're gonna talk about an odd case in the quantitative section, data interpretation question sets. Data interpretation questions require you, the test taker, to interpret data presented in various formats, tables, graphs, other visual presentations. There's going to be three data interpretation questions in each quant section or six score data interpretation questions in total on the test. All three questions in one section are presented together as they all go with one set of data. So we think of these a lot like these multi-question reading comprehension passages, a bunch of information given to us up top that's then used to answer a series of questions. 
However, data interpretation really isn't its own question type. The questions in the data interpretation set can be multiple choice select one, multiple choice select one or more, or numeric entry. They cannot be quantitative comparison. Now, while we'll want to approach each question in the set differently depending on its question type, similar to reading comprehension, data interpretation question sets as a whole get their own strategy. If you'd like to learn more about larger data interpretation strategy, check out our video on how to beat data interpretation questions. And those are all of the question types you'll see on the GRE. Thanks again for watching and feel free to check us out at gre.prepscholar.com for more GRE content. See you next time.